Well, Merry Christmas. Uh, for all those of you I have not met yet, my name is Pastor Dan, and it's great to be here. And I'm so thankful that you are joining us here on this Christmas Eve. You know, everybody wants Christmas to be perfect, don't they? they Christmas is special. It, it's one of those times of years where we want it to just be right. We want it to feel right. We want all the plans to go just right. Because, well, Christmas is special. And, and quite frankly, we... We almost we kind of judge our lives uh, by the quality and the quantity of our Christmases. And so we'll find ourselves saying things like, oh, remember 1995, our first Christmas together as a couple. Well, honestly, us guys, we don't say that. Our wives say that, right? <laughs> uh, us guys, we say things like, remember the first Christmas after we bought our first home? We were <laughs> dirt poor. Or we talk about how, you know, that year when grandma, she made uh, two salads and two meats and two potatoes and three vegetables and a cornucopia of bread and a smorgasbord of desserts. Wait, that was almost every year, right? But then we might think back and go, but remember that, that Christmas after she was gone? Remember the Christmas when everybody was sick? That was the worst Christmas ever. Or the Christmas when that massive snowstorm happened? That was, that was my favorite Christmas. I can only imagine what we'll say in a year or five or ten, right? Remember that year when we had to register to go to Christmas Eve and wear masks? And, and, and where we just stayed at home online? I, I mean, who knows what we'll say then, right? And then, if you got kids... I, I, you surely have one ornament on a tree that says baby's first Christmas, right? Where we moved, and in the midst of that, we found this picture. This is uh, the year Elizabeth did not want to go see Santa Christmas. <laughs> yeah, Christmas is special. It's unlike any other kind of holiday out there, right? We don't we don't celebrate the 4th of July and get fireworks that say baby's first 4th of July, do we? Uh, no, Christmas is just different. And maybe that's why we have such high expectations. And I, I get it when we were young, the high expectations were things like what we're going to get for Christmas. I know for me, I prayed for year after year. Oh, Lord, can I please, please get a dog? I had to wait till I was 40 and got it for my own kids. Or maybe it's the expectations of who you're going to be with. You just want to be with the family. You know, to have a family to get together. And that may or may not be possible this year. Or maybe you're like me and your expectations are like what you're going to get to eat on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Anybody? You know, with my parents, we always have shrimp cocktail and this crab dip and special K-bars. And for our family... It's, uh, well, it's either tamales or wild rice soup. I know that's kind of weird, but those are our two traditions. And yet, I remember it was probably 11 years ago when we put the wild rice soup in the crock pot before church, and then we didn't get back for a while. And do you know what happens when you cook cream for a while? It starts to curdle, and it makes your soup not taste very good. Actually, it makes it taste horrible. And, and so 11 years ago tonight, I was in Texas, and I was in the drive through of Taco Cabana. <laughs> now, if you guys don't know, Taco Cabana is very different than Taco Bell. It, its slogan is real Mexican fast food. I know, it sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? But so was that night, 45 minutes in the drive through I was posting online, you know, hashtag tag, epic Christmas Eve failed dinner kind of thing, you know. And yet, finally, I came back with the Christmas fajitas, and it was, it was a huge memory. You know, oftentimes, our best Christmas memories are something to do with the unexpected. Maybe it was a special gift that blew our, our, our mind, you know, took the breath away. Or maybe it was finally that family member being with us. Or maybe, maybe it was, you know, that massive snowstorm that caused you to be late or kept you there for a little bit longer, the massive, miserable cold snap that was so memorable. But 
oftentimes those unlikely, unexpected things make the best memories. And oftentimes they start out not how you expected, maybe even disappointing. Well, if we go back 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years ago, to that very first Christmas, we'll see that it's filled with the unexpected. It's filled with the unlikely. What, What the Bible teaches is that the greatest, most meaningful Christmas was a perfectly planned, unlikely, unexpected Christmas. And so let's take a look at that account once again. I know you just heard it before, but if you've got a Bible or if you've got your phone, you can go there with me into Luke chapter 2. And, and this is a section of Scripture that, that all of us, we've, I'm sure we've heard a, a number of times. And I don't know for you if it's one of those things that you get excited at Christmas to hear and you eat it up, or if it's one of those things you're like, yeah, yeah, I've heard that already before. You're a little skeptical about it, but wherever you're at today, my prayer is that you would do two things for me. First off, you'd actually listen, but you would listen for who this account is all about. And then you would listen for the unlikely and the unexpected. All right, so let's get started in verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken for the entire Roman world. And this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, Syria, excuse me. And everyone went to their own town to register. And so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, I don't know if you you caught the unlikely, the unexpected there, but for me, as I read that, it it seems amazing that this historic, history-changing event hinges upon this simple guy named Joseph in this this fiance, Mary, they're not even married yet, and she's pregnant, which was a big deal in that day. And Mary, she's from a tiny little unknown town called Nazareth. Quite frankly, we don't, in history, all of history, we don't ever hear of Nazareth before we get to Luke 2. And, and then later on, Scripture says it was an extremely poor city. And then they go on this epic journey. A journey of 100 miles on foot and donkey as they make their way to Bethlehem, a city near Jerusalem, for this census. And Mary's nine months pregnant, and they can't find a place to rest, nothing but a stable. And so the special one, the special baby is born next to a bunch of animals. This bassinet is, is a manger filled with hay, <laughs> a feeding trough. Then it goes on. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I would be too. <laughs> but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, because I bring, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel and praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. I think back to one of my favorite memories as a kid during Christmas and it was setting up the manger scene. I I always loved doing that. I was one who wanted to do that, unwrap all the ceramic beautifully painted figurines and and I, I know it's kind of weird but the two figurines that really stood out to me that I really liked were the camels and the shepherds they don't really go together but they were also the figurines in our set that then had all the dents and the broken limbs <laughs> because mom always had to keep saying Dan Dan they're not toys you know but I just kind of loved playing with the nativity set and yet the shepherds that we had before I dropped a few dozen times, honestly, they, 
they were probably like yours. They, were, they looked like hardworking, clean cut, respectable guys. And oftentimes when we read this account, that's what we, we think of, you know, with the shepherds. They were, they were clean cut, respectable, hardworking guys. But that's just not true. Now, as we dive into the history, into the context, what we find out is shepherds in that day, they were nomadic. They were, they were dirty. They were smelly. They were typically considered untrustworthy people because they lived in the hills. They worked hard. They faced dangers. But they were definitely not people you would say good religious family folk, you know? And yet it's to them, the outcasts, rough around the edges, that the big reveal came to share who this is all about. Our, our Savior King who, who's come, our Emmanuel who's broken in to fix all that is broken between us and God. To win back the world and to conquer sin. And all of a sudden you see that this Christmas, this Christmas, this very first Christmas isn't like you would expect. It's not through people you'd expect. It's not to people you'd expect. Not at all. The story goes on. It says, When the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, oh, we got to go. we got to go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told them about this child and all who heard it, they, they were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Mary, she treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things they had heard and seen were just as they had been told. And what they found was this, the Savior came in the most unexpected way to the least expected ones. He came to them. Now, I, I don't know where you sit right now. I don't know what kind of expectations you came with today. I don't know if um, you came searching for, for something. I mean, it's been a tough year. I get it. Or you came today and you're a bit skeptical about it all, kind of searching for something to go see. That's why I don't totally buy into this. I don't know if you came just because it's Christmas Eve and that's what you do. <laughs> even in the midst of a pandemic. I don't know if you came because somebody kind of pulled on you and said, hey, we're going to church. Okay, fine. But whatever it is, my, my prayer is that you would be surprised, you'd be moved to know that the very first Christmas, the, the most unlikely and unexpected Christmas is the most memorable and moving Christmas because it makes, it changes your Christmas today. It impacts you even today. This past month, we've been in a series called Emmanuel, God With Us, which is, it talks about the irony in the silent night, that it's in the midst of the silent night that we find the answer for the chaos and the craziness in each one of our lives. It, and we all have it, right? We're all struggling with something. I mean, this year, maybe you're struggling with a relationship that's imploding, or maybe you're, you're struggling with with fear of, of getting sick or of a loved one getting sick or maybe you're, you're worried because somebody in your life is sick or maybe you're struggling because somebody you loved is no longer here. Maybe you're dealing with, with an addiction or depression or, or, maybe, or maybe you're just trying to hold it all together after a humdinger of a year of 2020, right? If that's you, I get it. But what we find out is that in this Christmas story, we find the answer for all of that. All month we've been looking at this verse out of Matthew where it says the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That God is with you. Even you. Even today. And so also we can hear these words that the shepherds heard. The same words can be for us that I bring you good news of great joy for all the people that today in the town of David, the Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. 
He's come in the most unlikely way. But our God has come for you to be with you. I love Christmas. I really do. But honestly, it's, it's just the beginning of the story. You know that, right? I mean, it's just a prequel of what's to come that our Savior, our Lord, would then, well, willingly, innocently, He would head straight to the cross in your place and in mine, taking all the chaos, the craziness, the sin, the guilt, all the stuff we struggle, and paying for it once and for all to bring us hope and joy and peace and grace so he might be our savior king and yet we struggle sometimes with the unlikely and the unexpected don't we struggle to see where that's going or how it impacts us turn one last place first corinthians chapter one Seven years ago tomorrow, I was traveling from Little Rock, Arkansas to Iowa. I was going to see my parents with my family, and about halfway in that trip, we get a phone call that says, my dad's telling me that mom's about ready to go into surgery. I'm like, what? They had a, they had a snowstorm, and um, it was the same year that uh, I got a puppy for the kids, and my mom wanted to clean off the patio so the puppy would have somewhere to go and once he got up there. And when she went out there, she started to shovel off the snow and she slipped, she fell, she broke her ankle. And so she was, she was out of surgery about the time that we first got there. Didn't come home till the next day. And we brought her home and laid her on the couch and she's like, you know, half there. And, her elaborate plan for a major Christmas feast was out the window. We're all in the kitchen, salvaging something, making up something, I don't know. But as crazy and as chaotic and as a mess as that Christmas was, there were some amazing memories. I remember carrying my mom up because they lived in a two-story house and her bedroom was upstairs, carrying her up to her bedroom the first night. And then the best memory of all is the grandkids teaching her to slide down the stairs on her behind <laughs> to get downstairs. Oh, what a mess, but what an awesome Christmas. Huh. Maybe we got hope for 2020, right? What we as followers of Jesus believe when we celebrate the birth of a baby born in a barn, when we we worship a king that has been rejected by the world, and when we praise a Savior who willingly went to a brutal death in our place, that in the unlikely and the unexpected, our Emmanuel has come for us, that our Savior has come to save us, to free us, to bring hope and joy to us. And I get it that that some people, they're going to struggle with that, right? They're going to struggle to understand that or get that or or think it makes any sense or that it applies to them in some kind of way. They they may think that's ridiculous. In fact, 1 Corinthians says this, For the message of of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Verse 22, Jews demand signs and Greeks, they look for wisdom, but but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called both Jews, Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Friends, there's power in the cross power and a savior who would come into this world to simple people be born as a baby in a barn would show up in the grand entrance to a bunch of outcasts and crazy people there's power power in the fact that our god has come to us for us to save us and so my prayer is that this story would be more than just a story to you that this unexpected unlikely Christmas would, would overwhelm your Christmas in your life this year. 
And that no matter what, what you're dealing with right now, what, what kind of conflict or issues or struggles or fears or loneliness or guilt, that you would realize that you would hold on to the fact that your Emmanuel, your Savior King, has come for you to bring life 